G'day everybody, Ray Munday here from Team Associated, J Concepts and Reedy down here in Australia and welcome to my video on dynamic weight transfer. This is part two of my video series on weight transfer. So if you haven't seen part one, I'd recommend to go back and watch it. What we're going to cover today are the dynamics of how weight transfer occurs in both cornering and acceleration around a racetrack. Now why is this important? Uh, in the part one video I talked about last week, we talked about the static weight transfer. This is what happens in the middle of the corner or in the middle of acceleration, once you're already in that situation. But if you think about going around a racetrack, when we go around a corner, the first thing that happens is we've actually got to get the car going into the corner. Then when we finish the corner, we get out of the corner. Accelerating, we're on the throttle or off the throttle. These are dynamic situations. Things are, are changing. Now, if you go back to the video part one, we talk about weight transfer is something we're stuck with. There's physics that we can't break. The center of gravity height sits above the ground. The tire force acts on the ground. So because of this, when you accelerate, the tire force on the ground is at a different height to the center of gravity height. That creates a, a moment that loads the tires on this end and unloads on this end. We're kind of stuck with that. But with a vehicle with suspension, what we are able to do is control how fast that happens. Now to understand that, I'm gonna be covering today a couple of topics. Firstly, sprung versus unsprung mass, why that's important. And then the factors that control the rate of sprung mass transfer, springs, shock absorbers, and geometry. So let's jump into it. I'm gonna use, I've got my B6.3D here, my two wheel drive buggy from Team Associated, as an example. We're gonna start with mass, and especially the sprung mass and the unsprung mass, and why that's important. Now I mentioned last week that a go-kart basically has no suspension, so its weight transfer is going to happen very, very quickly. With our vehicles with suspension, it's a little bit different. You've got two parts of the mass to the car. There's the unsprung mass, which is basically your wheels, tires, suspension components, front and rear. They are connected almost directly to the ground. Then there's the sprung mass, and this is all the, the body, the chassis, the electronics, everything that's held up by the, the springs and shock absorbers. Now, the key point with this is that when we're going around a track, the sprung mass can move on the suspension. The unsprung mass is directly connected to the ground. Why is this important? Well, firstly, the, when we, let's put some numbers to, to what we're talking about here. In the case of a B6.3D, the front unsprung mass is about 130 grams. The rear unsprung mass is about 165 grams. So total about just under 300 grams out of our 1,600 grams is sprung, uh, unsprung mass. So this is the mass that's connected directly to the ground. The unsprung mass is about, sorry, the sprung mass, it's easy to get confused. The sprung mass, the main body and chassis, is about 1,300 grams. So roughly 80% of our weight is held up by the suspension. Now, if you recall from part one of the video, weight transfer happens, uh, or the, the amount of weight transfer is controlled by the height of the center of gravity, how much force we've got, and the spacing that we have. So when we have uh, weight transfer, we're kind of stuck with, with how much there is. Uh, in acceleration, we looked last week, there's about 385 grams of weight transfer that happens. Uh, and in cornering, there's about 540 grams that happens on, on this car at one and a half G. Now, the unsprung mass and the sprung mass both have their own center of gravity. Uh, in the case of the B6.3, they're almost at the same height. The center of gravity is about 45 mil. The center of gravity of the uh, unsprung mass, the suspension is around 45 mil as well. So, but the unsprung mass has its own weight transfer. So when we first go into a corner or we're accelerating, we can split the amount of weight transfer between how much is being taken by the suspension through the unsprung mass. This is the bit that's connected directly to the ground and how much is in the sprung mass. Now in the case of uh, cornering, roughly out of the 540 grams, roughly 100 grams is from the unsprung mass. That still leaves 440 grams coming through the sprung mass. In acceleration, it's kind of similar numbers. 70 grams from the unsprung, 315 from the sprung. Roughly 80% of the weight transfer is gonna happen through because of the sprung mass that moves around. But what it means is, yeah, when, when we first turn into a corner, we first accelerate, the, there's some weight transfer that happens from the unsprung mass. We can't control that, we're kind of stuck with it. It happens almost straight away because the tires are nice and stiff. So what we're gonna be talking about mainly, this 80% that's left over, this 80% of weight transfer that comes from the sprung mass. Now the sprung mass is connected to the ground or to the, through the suspension by three 
Macy components, the spring, the shock absorber, and the geometry. So let's talk about those. Firstly, the spring. Uh, a spring is a device that whose force is related to how far it's moved. Not how fast, but how far it's moved. So in the case of a coil spring like I've got here, it's sitting at its resting height with the, the pretend it's in the vehicle and there's, there's the weight of the car on it. Now, to compress the spring takes additional force. To extend the spring, you have to have less force. And we measure a spring by how, how much force there is for how far we move it. So a stiff spring has more force build up when we move it a certain amount uh, in both positives. So a, a stiff spring will have a higher force increase when we compress it and a higher force decrease when we extend it. Now, in the case of weight transfer, the, the best way to think about it is kind of maybe the other way around, which is that with weight transfer, we have a certain amount of force that's going to be going through the suspension. So a stiff spring will move less for that amount of force. A soft spring will move more. So let's consider a car going through a corner. When you've got a very stiff spring, the inside uh, of the, oh, sorry, the outside of the car won't have to compress so far. The inside of the car won't have to extend so far to reach the amount of weight transfer that we need to get to. Uh, if we've got a very soft spring, uh, it'll have to, the outside has to compress more and the inside has to extend more. So when you've got a, 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 a spring controlling the car, it controls how far the car rolls. So if, in the case of cornering, a stiff spring means that the car doesn't need to roll as far, the outside doesn't compress as much and the inside doesn't extend as much to achieve the amount of weight transfer we need. A soft spring will need to roll a lot more to achieve the same weight transfer. So one of the things that you hear a lot of people talking is, we'll put a soft spring on to increase weight transfer. It actually doesn't quite work like that. A soft spring still has basically the same weight transfer, but it has to move further to get there. This will come a little bit later on to, in this uh, video. We'll talk about how these things phase together. Now, an anti-roll bar is another uh, example of a spring. It's a spring that controls how much force is built up as the suspension rolls. So it's a type of spring. The coil spring, the anti-sway bar, they're both types of springs. And the force of a spring is dependent on how far it moves. The second force that we need to consider in our suspension that controls our sprung mass is the shock absorber. Now a shock absorber, or a damper as it's more correctly known, its force is related to how fast it moves. Not how far it's moving, but how fast it's moving. So a shock absorber, if you move it very slowly, its force is quite low. If you move it fast, you'll feel its force builds up much quicker. A heavy shock absorber, will build up more force at a certain speed than a light shock absorber. So when it comes to controlling the sprung mass, and again, we'll, we'll probably just consider cornering as the easiest to think about, the shock absorber controls how fast the chassis is gonna move. So when we turn in the corner, there's a weight transfer that needs to happen on that sprung mass. The shock absorber will control how fast it, it will move there. And the spring and the shock absorber work together. But basically a, a very thick shock absorber will give more force for a certain speed. So in uh, weight transfer, it means it will slow the movement of the car down. Force is still the same, but it controls how, uh, how quickly that mass will move. The spring and the shock absorber need to work together, but basically a shock absorber controls how fast something moves. And it only provides a force while it's moving. Well, once you've got into the middle of the corner and the car's kind of taken a set, it's in the steady state middle of the corner, that shock absorber is not moving, it's now compressed, it basically has no force. But when we first turn in the corner and everything has to move, it provides a force. So that's the second component. Now the third component is the geometry. This one's probably the most controversial. There's a lot of information around uh, roll centers and anti-squat, which is what a geometry force is based on. So I'll try to cover uh, as high level as I can. I'm not gonna teach you how to uh, find your roll center. There's plenty of material out there on trying to find roll centers and anti-squat. I'm going to talk about what does it mean. Now, firstly, I'll take, try to take it back to how I, how I think how these things work. Uh, it's a bit easier if you consider the physics of it. Let's look at our front suspension of our V6.3 here. The, the arms, when it's like this, the arms are pointed upwards. Now, when we're going through a corner, there's a force acting on the tire. That force goes to connect to the sprung mass, which is the, the main chassis. It has to go through the suspension links. Now, at this position, these suspension links are pointed upwards in towards the middle. 
So this outside wheel, as it points, of, as the force is applied at the tire, it actually goes up through the suspension, pointing up slightly. And on the uh, inside of the car, so if we're turning this way, on the inside, the tire's force is going this way. So it's actually pulling down on the suspension here. So while the sprung mass is trying to roll outwards in the corner, this part of suspension is actually pushing it, trying to push it back up. This one is trying to stop the inside from lifting by pulling it down. So the way that these geometry forces work is that actually the, the, the force that's at the tire contact patch that's going along the ground, it has to get transmitted up into the chassis of the car. Now a roll center, uh, so for example, what we've got here, this is like a high roll center. The arms are pointing upwards. The, the outside is actually trying to stop the chassis from pushing, pushing down, and the inside is trying to stop it from lifting up. You can uh, rearrange uh, that in the way that you draw these forces as it being like there's the tire force on the ground, but then that goes, that force is applied to the chassis a little bit above ground, which is the roll center. So when we have uh, the example of, of drawn here, we've got the roll center a little bit above ground and then the center of gravity height up here. When we look at, we talked last week in the, in the part one video of the, the roll moment, which is the height of the center of gravity above ground. But what actually the, the sprung mass feels is where the, it's the height from the center of gravity to the height of where the forces go into the chassis, which is the roll center in the case of cornering. That's that center point of forces from the tire where it applies to the chassis is called the roll center. So you hear that talked around a lot. That's what it actually means. It's the, it's the point when the car's going through a corner, it's where are the forces from the suspension going into the, the sprung mass. So this blue line here is the height from the center of gravity to the roll center. Now it's not exactly the same as the height of the center of gravity of the ground. But what it means is the weight transfer that's going to the sprung mass, so the, the, the blue part I've put here, is related to the height difference from the center of gravity to the roll center. So let's say the roll center is five millimeters above ground and our center of gravity is 45. That means only 40 of those 45 millimeters of height of the center of gravity is actually going into a moment trying to roll the, the sprung mass. So a high, center, a high roll center, uh, if you take the point of a roll center being so high that it's actually at the center of gravity height, there's actually no roll angle that will come to the, to the sprung mass because it's the force and the center of gravity height are the same. But if you remember back to last week, I said we can't change the laws of physics. We have a certain amount of roll center, a uh, certain amount of weight transfer that happens. So what happens with this other force? Well, it's actually that the, this force that's transmitted to the, the chassis is also what's being transmitted through the suspension. So you have another weight transfer that's caused by the geometry, which is the height of the roll center multiplied by the force here. So the two add up to give you the same total force, but the roll center force, what's going through the geometry, you don't see it in terms of the, the, the vehicle moving around. It's being transmitted directly to the ground. Now, what does all this mean? A high roll center means you have less uh, roll angle in the end for the vehicle because there's less moment trying to, to turn the sprung mass. But it means you have more weight transfer coming through the suspension. And what's really important with this, if you think about it, is that these forces going through the geometry, they build up straight away. As soon as there's a tire force, that force is gonna be there. So it's a very quick reacting force. A roll center force happens straight away. The sprung mass, we've talked, we need the spring and the shock absorber to build up the force. So where this is all leading to in terms of dynamic weight transfer is by understanding our roll centers, our springs and our shocks, we can control and understand the, um, the speed of weight transfer or the dynamics of weight transfer. Now I've talked roll center here, but anti-squat is very, very similar. Anti-squat is a geometry force. It's where, we, because we've got the suspension arms angled up a little bit to the front, as the rear, uh, as, you, as you accelerate and the rear tire gives it a force, it actually pushes upwards into the chassis slightly. So it tries to stop the chassis from pitching down as much at the back, but it also, that opposite force, it pushes the tire into the ground. So there's some force taken in, in the geometry. So anti-squat and roll center are what they call geometry forces, or in some places they'll call it geometric load transfer. Um, in the case of, I've, I've used the example here, of if we have a, a roll center five millimeters above ground, we get about 50 grams uh, worth of weight transfer from that roll center. That's still about 390 grams from the sprung mass. So 
depending on how high or low the roll center is, you can change how much uh, force that you have there. Where this is all leading to, as I said, is the dynamics of weight transfer though, and the phasing. And this is probably the most critical bit that I'd really like you to, to, to take away, hopefully from the video today. And that is, okay, we can build up forces using roll centers and springs and, and et cetera, but what, is it, what does it really mean? Well, let's take the example I've shown here of turning through a corner. Um, I've got the red line here being our lateral G. So we, we build up a lateral G, go through a corner, and then we, we straighten up. When we first build up the lateral G, the, the critical thing that happens is the roll center forces, which are the ones in, in black in my drawing here, they happen straight away. As soon as you build up tire force, the roll center force happens. So that's your instant force. And that stays all the way while there's, uh, all the way through the corner while there's G force on the tire. Those geometry forces or roll center forces will be there. Now, once you've got the roll center forces into the chassis, then the chassis and the sprung mass is going to start rolling. Now that takes some time, it's, it's got weight, it's 1300 grams worth there. So it's gonna take a little bit of time. As we talked, the first thing that will then happen is it'll start to move. Now when it starts to move, the shock absorber is gonna start having some effect because it's got some speed. The spring has almost no effect because it's not moved very far. So the green, which is the shock absorber force, will be the next one. And then while the vehicle is actually rolling, the shock absorber force will be high. Then the, the more time it is, the more the chassis will roll, the more the spring force builds up. So I think what you can start to see here, and I've drawn some little red arrows there for the phasing. The first thing that happens is roll center, very quick build up. Then the shock absorber is the next force. Then the third force is the spring. So depending on how we balance these forces, we can control how fast it takes or how long it takes for the weight transfer to build up. It's actually taken quite a bit of time here for the weight transfer to fully build up as the vehicles roll. Now, in terms of these cases here, we've used some examples about 50 grams and about 400 grams totally. Um, when you then finish the corner, that's another thing, is that actually the first thing that happens is you take away the force. So then the, the, the first thing that happens is the roll center force drops, then the, uh, then the shock absorber force acts in another direction and the spring force starts to drop. So we've got some phasing of how we can control. Geometry force is first, shock absorber force is second, spring force is third. And as we talked though, the spring is what controls how far it actually goes. So the, the spring is the bit that controls the final steady state. The, uh, the shock absorber controls the speed to get there a lot as well. Now there's an additional component here to think about. When we're turning into a corner, the first thing that happens, we're going straight, we've got no slip angle front and rear. The first thing that happens is we turn into a corner. The front tires now have built up slip angle. They now start to grip. So you've got force going through the front suspension, but it takes some time before the car starts to yaw and the rear tires build up grip. So there's a bit of a time delay from the front to the rear when you turn in the corner. Then once you finish, so you're going through the corner and you want to straighten up, you've now taken uh, slip angle away from the front tire, the rear is still slipping and it needs to straighten the car up. When we look at these forces here, there's an additional uh, factor to consider, which is that when we first turn in the corner, front force builds up first. That means front roll center acts first. Then there's some time before the rear. So when we first turn into a corner, front roll center is the first one. A little bit later is the rear roll center, then the spring and the shock start to work together. When we finish a corner, you turn what you de-steer the front, so the front roll center drops away. Uh, the car starts to de-roll, but the rear roll center is is going to hang on for longer. So when we are looking at the dynamics of cars, when we first turn into a corner, the front roll center has a really big impact on the, that initial feel. Then the rear roll center, if the rear doesn't feel like it's catching up, that's when you adjust the rear roll center. Then if the car feels like it's rolling too fast through the corner, you adjust your shocks. If it feels like it's rolling too far, that's usually either the springs or maybe your roll centers can be too low. The roll centers do impact in the middle of the corner, but mainly springs. So we, when we tune our car, if we understand these phases of dynamic weight transfer, we can understand what's the, the right thing to do. So you'll think, yeah, normally that way to get the car to, to react quickly, well, your front roll center's the best chance of that because that's the first force that builds up. When you're exiting a corner, the rear roll center is really critical because the rear takes the time to, to, to degrip. Uh, when we're accelerating, we have a similar uh, uh, weight transfer scenario. So if we take the two-wheel drive, when we first accelerate, 
there's some force that goes up through the, the, the anti-squat geometry force to plant the tire in the ground. So if we want more initial bite, we can add more anti-squat. And on really low traction surfaces, we tend to, to do that because that gives that initial plant into the ground. Then uh, a, a stiffer spring will actually build the weight transfer up quicker as well. A soft spring will take a bit of time to, to, to build up weight transfer. When we look at, I'll give you a, a little case example here of a stiff spring versus a soft spring in roll. Um, why do we want soft springs sometimes versus stiff springs? Well, let's take a roll. So we, we're going, rolling into the corner. If you have a very soft spring, it takes longer to get, uh, to build up the weight transfer. And if you remember, I talked last uh, week in part one about how two equally loaded tires actually grip a better than one heavily loaded and one lightly loaded tire. So when we are turning into the corner, if we've got soft springs, because it's taking time to build up weight transfer, those two tires are gonna stay more equally loaded longer. So you're gonna get more traction in, in the corner. The problem is though, that it takes longer for the car to get to a set. So the car will feel a little bit sluggish and it might feel like you've got to really be, be smooth on the steering and wait for it to get in the corner. <clears throat> it also means if the car moves too fast, that it overshoots. And when it overshoots, it actually compresses further than it needed to. And that can then mean you get extra weight transfer, which can then unload the inside tires and potentially give a traction roll. So when you've got, uh, we, we need to balance our weight transfer speed depending on the surface and the tire. Slick, low traction surfaces, normally we want to be a little bit softer spring so we keep the tires more equally loaded. But on a high traction surface, that can mean the car can, can roll too far, unload the inside too quickly or too much as it overshoots, and then that creates a traction roll. High traction surfaces, we normally want the car to be nice and reactive so we can make it stiffer, in which case it will react, uh, it'll, it'll take a set faster and it doesn't roll as far. Now our cars also have uh, a little bit of an extra uh, feature in that we tend to run very low roll centers in our, in our especially our off-road buggies and especially on very slick tracks. In fact, we run them below ground. And that actually means that when we first turn into a corner, what it's actually doing is when you're going through, uh, say like a left-hand corner, it actually pushes the inside right down and lifts the outside up. So this means that you, you, you have uh, more equal weight transfer for longer, but it means that the chassis actually is gonna roll more. It's a little bit harder to visualize that, but that's the, the, the phasing is still the same. You have, when you first turn in a corner, front roll center. The car yours a little bit, rear roll center, starts to roll, dampers, then as it builds up in the corner, the spring is more important. Now this is it's a lot of complexity to this subject and there's a lot of interrelationships between how heavy the car is, the geometry you've got, the springs, the roll centers, the tires, uh, and so this is where it's, it's, it's a fantastic subject. Uh, I've been involved in vehicle dynamics, studying it since I was a teenager, working on full-size vehicles for over 20 years. And every time I get to the track, I learn something new. That's what I love about this. But the, the concepts and the fundamentals, I hope from this video have been able to be explained as to why the, how the different forces build up, how we can utilize the different tuning parameters to adjust what the car feels like on the initial turn in, through the transition into the mid corner. Um, I will come back to one of the most complex parts of our, or any vehicle dynamics is the tires, and each tire needs something slightly different. Each tire and surface needs a slightly different level of weight transfer rate. Um, slick tracks tend to need very smooth buildup of weight transfer. Soft, more old school, loose dirt, loamy tracks, they like really quick weight transfer, so you can dig the tire in the ground. On those, you generally run a, a high roll center. I hope that I've been able to demystify some of the uh, some of the, these, these concepts in dynamic weight transfer. I really hope that you can apply them to your racing. I'm sure I haven't been able to answer all your questions, so please make sure after you've read this, maybe watch it a second time just to see if it makes sense the next time. If not, drop me a, a, a message on Ask Ray Monday or on my YouTube. Uh, I'll try to respond as, as well as I can. I really hope that you've got something out of this video. I hope it in, uh, helps you enjoy your driving, get more out of your setup. And most importantly, it helps you have fun in RC. I'm Ray Monday. Thanks very much for watching. See you soon.